Thank you, Matt, for the kind introduction, and thank, I would like to thank all the organizers for inviting me to give a paper on the part that I've taken from my PhD work on the Schleswig waterfront. It's a medieval harbor site in northern Germany, and it uh, was during the High Middle Ages an important hub for long-distance trade in northern Europe. Um, I deal with a lot of old excavation data, mainly uh, drawings resulting out of artificial layers. And uh, in the course of the analysis, um, I had problems with these artificial layers and a lot of positivistic interpretations um, from the analysts of the former excavators back then. So this was a challenge that made me set up a Chen Laboratoire, which is basically highlights all steps of a workflow and the way data was changed every step. It's strongly linked to Tonya's approach uh, on the study of archaeological knowledge production and another empirical work on its own. The Chen Operatoire is um, more to be understood as a tool or guide rather than a comprehensive study, but therefore can easily be understood and used by colleagues who are not in the series and approaches of knowledge production. I would like to start with some background information on uh, Hedeby Schleswig. Hedeby is the Viking Age predecessor of Schleswig. It's a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site since two years. And both places are really close to each other, located on the Jutland Peninsula at its narrowest part. And therefore, it's, it's a favorable spot in terms of long distance trade as it links the North Sea, the Baltic, as well as the continent of Scandinavia. And that becomes obvious when we zoom into the province of Schleswig-Holstein, where both places are located. Um, both places are under this, um, uh, located here. And you have easy access by ship from the Baltic as well as from, from the North Sea. And it's kind of a, a border situation where we have Danes, Frees, and Saxons last in the early and high Middle Ages. When we zoom into the Schleifjord, the inner end of the Schleifjord, uh, had to be its famous semicircular rampart, 25 hectares in size, and together with the famous um, fortification line of the Danewirke, um, is in the south, and two kilometers up north is the today city of Schleswig, with a quite small old town located. You can see it on this aerial. It's um, a former peninsula of two and a half hectares, and this is where most excavations were undertaken, I'm going to talk about to you in a second. What's quite emblematic is those large cathedral still in use. Back in the analog age of the 70s, um, officials decided to make the Schleswig uh, to, to undergo a large autumn restoration campaign. It was started out in the 60s and that resulted in major excavations in the 70s and 80s. And as Schleswig, um, yeah, has really good preservation conditions for organic material. They had a other obstacle to, to do a lot of excavation work within a quite short period of time. And so they uh, adopted an uh, excavation methodology undertaken already in Hedeby in the 60s, where we have, they used prisoners and workers um, for the major earthworks to ex excavate artificial layers of 15 centimeters, and then professional drafters were documenting all the layers, and then they excavated again next 15 centimeters. This ended up in this great scale drawings together with written informations, but back then they didn't take any photo documentation. There were no lists, no diaries, nothing or not at all. So just the, the old excavation drawings made on transparencies are the um, main documentation of those excavations. And this is a map of um, Schleswig is Oton Peninsula topographic map, and you see the blue line is the former shore line of the 11th century. And I mainly deal with the so called harbor excavations and the, the interference of, of land and water, and mainly with the largest excavation until today, the Plessenstraße. So, transferring those analog data in the digital age, um, we developed a processing methodology. Uh, including scanning, then using ArcGIS to draw those scans, attributing them in the article table, adding, a, connecting an access database, adding dendro dates, more than 500 of them, and the we had to deal with a lot of those drawings as they were large scale. Um, 
So by S350 in total, uh, we have 1.2 meters to 15 centimeters and scale 1 to 20. So you can imagine this is quite, uh, quite some information um, um, written down on those uh, drawings. As you can see, uh, it's uh, hard to see. I have some better pictures in coming up. Um, but they put everything on those drawings, like uh, the measurements, sample names, um, wood features, stone features, as well as information on, on the soil and stratigraphy. And an intermediate stage was when all those more than 250 planar drawings have been drawn. This ended up in more than 9,000 wooden features and resulted in this chaotic picture. So this is, was the basis before the cultural historic interpretation took place. Emerging um, against this background, the old methods on the one hand and on the other is the digitalization, it was my idea to disclose the workflow to enable the reader to follow every single interpretive step. By this, one is aware of the advantages and disadvantages of the methodology and the interpretation. And in addition, the reader is capable of drawing his own conclusions. When we talk about the production of archaeological knowledge, one must keep in mind, and I think we all agree on that, that the actions involved in the process of knowledge production are subject to interpretation and therefore are to be understood as social products. This is not only true for cultural historic classifications, but also for simple technical operations who are often understood as objective, neglecting the interpretive aspect. And the chain of Artois presented in the following is based upon the approach of Tonia Davidovich, who used the actor network theory to describe the excavation-based archaeological knowledge production. Here, knowledge creation is understood as a translation network where the complexity and ambiguity of features are transcribed into clear statements. These statements are called inscriptions. The network comprises both the human actors that are shaped by individual knowledge, conventions, and traditions, the non -human actin, um, and the non-human actants. These are features with climatic, pedological, and environmental conditions, excavation equipment, instruments, as well as written and graphic inscriptions, just to name the most important ones. The inscriptions themselves are the result of every translational step undertaken by the actors in the interplay with the actants. This means that every time operations and knowledge production are undertaken, the nature of data changes. And the way how it changed is dependent on the actors and the actants. From the planning to the, of the excavation to the publication of the results, the archaeologic information buried in the soil can undergo up to dozens of changes, depending on excavation methodology, and post-processing work. And what are on, on this place is just a selection of the inscriptions made during the process. And for my specific work to process all those uh, analog data, of course the digital inscriptions are the most important ones, like database entries, shape files, 3D files, images, etc. Basically, interpretation of steps are rarely mentioned or even described in detail in archaeological monographs. What I did for the Plessenstrasse excavation was a bit this Chen Apparatoire. It looks like, a bit like a Harris matrix, and which uh, names all steps from the town planning until the final publication. And it ended up with a total of, of 17 steps, and every step is demarcated with the uh, white box saying the action taken out and the gray box is naming the actor. And in addition, I have published in a uh, large table also naming the uh, inscriptions and the actants involved in uh, every single step. The steps one to nine deal with um, the planning of the excavation, the excavation itself, and the former publication by the excavators back in the 80s and 90s. And this is, uh, yeah, nine steps that I couldn't take part actively as I haven't been born back then. So I was able to need to reconstruct those steps by archival material, oral interviews, information taken from publications, and some of the few photos that I 
they would were available. I'm going to explain to you some of the single steps in this, uh, uh, of those to get you aware how it works, make you aware how it works. It's, I have to apologize, I haven't translated every single step into English, but the one I'm talking about are translated. So it started out with the town planning, the town planners in the 70s uh, making decision to, to, to do this old town restoration campaign. Then we have the excavation leader defining the, the location of the trenches, and then um, yeah, it ended up with, uh, or started out with earthwork and cleaning undertaken by the workers and prisoners. This is the fifth step, and it looked like that, that back then in the early 70s, they were digging and cleaning. And they were also allowed to collect fines, but they collected those fines in large credits of 25 centimeters per, per layer. The next step, step seven, uh, step six, discussing and defining the features. And this has been undertaken in strictly hierarchical order by the excavation leader and later also the skilled drafters. Workers were entitled to take part. Inscriptions were made by a needle scratching boundaries in the soil. This is especially true for the, for the strata. And this is what Vatonia defines as the archaeological practice when the archaeologist steps up to the profile and in really make a inscription by with this needle. Step seven contains the drawing and measuring of planner and profiles, labeling features, adding measurement and labels. And this looks like this. We have now a better picture of such a drawing or some part of the drawing. We have, we have the drafter here, two technicians doing the measuring on the profile. And this is a planner drawing, of course, but you see a lot of information only con yeah, really condensed in condensed manner. Better. We have a corduroy street with a raised floor. Here we have like planks with notches, probably uh, stemming from a house. We have a hearse made from stone and different kind of yeah, soil colors, water wood fences, and so on. The inscriptions, although these are the inscriptions in the step, the, um, the, the, the drawings made on transparencies. And the interpretation of aspects on this drawings are manifold. The choice of color, of course, is highly dependent on, on the drafter and the symbology developed. Then the drawing on the paper is, of course, not, uh, it has uh, some problems. When we have one point, the, uh, on the one hand, we have the measurers, and on the other hand, we have the, the drawing drawers, the drafter who does the drawing, and it's all not always um, that precise. Basically, collecting the fines and uh, doing these inscriptions uh, on the transparencies um, is, was the basis for several publications in the 80s and the 90s who focused on the finds to large parts. The features were not systematically analyzed and have therefore just been briefly published as an overview. This is pretty much the outcome of the analog age. And the primary idea of the excavators back then to analyze the features by placing to the transparencies on light tables seemed to have failed. So you can imagine when we have, we have cultural layers up to four meters, organic material, um, preservation up to three meters, and when you place more than, than, than two or three transparencies, uh, transparencies of a light table, you are not able to look through them and find out about the, the single poles. So it's, um, it, it is possible in a way, but it takes probably decades to go through all those 250 drawings. Step 10 to, to, to 17 comprise the steps from the digitalization to the synthesizing to the publication. And when the excavation documentation entered the digital age in 2012, after 35 years by me and my colleagues, a plenty of possibilities were opened. As the data was generally limited to drawings, the goal was to extract as much information as possible from them. Several steps were necessary to process the data and make them suitable for archaeological comparison and historical contextualization. Step 10 comprises three operations undertaken by different actors. But the main work focused on the digitalization of the scanned drawings. And this was undertaken by a technician. The technician digitized the archaeological features of more than 250 drawings and attributed them. And this was taken out by a computer, a digitizing screen with pen, 
ArcGIS and ArcGIS software. This step ended up in hundreds of shape files or inscriptions containing archaeological features of wood, stone, and soil. And during this step, the features changed in size to a small extent during the drawing in GIS. And also the original coloration got lost. More than often, and that was a huge problem, the soilers didn't have clear boundaries, as you will be aware of. And um, so as polygon features in GIS need to be closed, this was solved by interpolation. And this is how it looked like. We have the analog drawing, and then we have the, the digital. Um, you have the shape file of, of the wooden, wooden features of one layer, and this is the uh, attribute table with already some entries. Step 11, the following step undertaken by me, was a strong and a part of action. This was when all shape files of all layers from one trench were merged. This was necessary as plenty of wooden features as poles stood upright and have therefore been drawn several times. To end up with a single features containing all information, strong interpolation was necessary. And this is especially true for inclined woods. You see them, many spots, they've been drawn several times and you see a slight inclination and they, they are not overlap each other perfectly. And they couldn't, this inclination couldn't be displayed, of course, in a single shape file. So there uh, was an uh, entry made in the database. The diameter and the outline were also a problem, as piles has pointed or rotted ends. And in addition, information of the lower end of many wooden features was missing, what ended up in an interpolation too. Furthermore, the attribute table was complemented with data summing up all entries of the wooden features. The outcoming shape, or inscription, was now contained all information from the original analog drawings, but also, as shown, the data has already changed several times. The next step continued further when the data was transferred to the uh, 3D application ArcScene, and it resulted in an uh, interpolated model of the wooden features. In this step, the features were just extruded to the total length, and therefore don't show any inclination, tool marks, notches, or changes in diameters, a really sterile picture, and not a real image of what has been excavated. But it's of course necessary for stratigraphic interpretation and to seeing how the, the single features relate to each other. In the following steps, 13 to 17, I describe the process that are usually understood by most archaeologists as interpretation, uh, addressing groups of features as houses, wells, ovens, ramparts, etc., and putting the data in a broader cultural historic context. And this is what I did in step 15. I defined, finally defined groups of features that belong to one structure on the basis of its position, its alignment, its stratigraphy, dating, and shape. And then I already added those different strata I have. We have the, old, the former level of the Oton Peninsula. We have some limnic sands and the estimated water level of the 11th century. And then, yeah, of course, you have in, 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 um, those poles aligned. They are connected by, by joke beams, and then we have a corduroy street showing up. And this um, defining of structures was, was the main basis then. I added, when, when we, we came to the cultural historic interpretation, I added all the background um, necessary in the transition of Viking Age to the High Middle Ages and, and Southern Scandinavia. We're talking about buzzwords like Christianization, the professionalization of merchant seafaring, uh, the Danish rulers became territorial rulers, and so on. And this all affected the final interpretation, which ended up in my publication and this 3D image of the classic water found around 1100 AD, which shows a vital harbor situation with a marketplace, several um, platforms emerging to the shallow water of the Schlei within a couple of years, hosting uh, long distance traders, and a lot of other things. But this is yeah, just the intermediate picture of, of uh, um, my, what I think it might have looked like back then on the basis of my analysis. 
So basically, I do only have to conclude, the presented chain operatoire raises the awareness for the interpretation aspects. It enables one to draw its own conclusions. But when you're a reader of, of my book or when, when you're interested in the topic, you can sneak in at every single step I have highlighted and take the data to that point and draw your own conclusions. And when you add your, diff your personal background, your personal information, when you're not convinced by my, my interpretations or cultural historic, cultural historic interpretations, you can yeah, draw your own conclusions. As you know, where, where every single step of interpretation was uh, started. And this is really always highlighted in my, my PhD work. It lays open the changes of data in the course of digitalization and it helps to link analog documentation and digital methods. Finally, it yeah, of course highlights the advantages and disadvantages of the digitalization in the course of the um, processing of analog excavation data. And I would like to end with this uh, rocker guy one of the prisoners back then doing the sieving in the 70s, and thank you for your attention. you uh, used actor ne network theory as well and uh, I'm gonna throw it open to the audience for questions so, uh, yes thank you. Um, thank you this is a really fascinating paper I have so many questions I'll just stick with one um, I really appreciated the way that you um, talked about the hierarchies of labor um, and the different types of people who are able to do particular types of tasks. But I, I just have to ask, like, what is the deal with the prisoners? Like, how did that come about? <laughs> with what? Sorry? The prisoners who were... Wh why were there prisoners working on this site? They were cheap. They were for free. And they were supposed to do labor work to not get bored in prison. And it was... was um, a yeah, common practice in, in uh, the province of Schleswig-Holstein in the 60s and 70s. It was taken out, they were sent to, to the cesspits in Lübeck, they were excavating in Hedeby, they had their own barrack with, with personnel guarding them, and they also then, they, yeah, in the 70s, they were also in use and um, used, uh, yeah, they, they were, uh, supposed to work in, in the 70s in Schleswig too. But then it changed, and later they got people from, from the job center, but uh, yeah. That's, that's fascinating, thank you. <laughs> yes, it was uh, very common in England also to use uh, uh, prisoners and uh, also young offenders and so on uh, back in the 1970s. That's not how I started in archaeology, <laughs> by the way. Um, but um, yes, any more questions? Felix, right. thanks for that yeah. uh, that great talk. And the, one of the last yeah. things you said was the most interesting to me. You said that in your in your publication, you linked the stages of the of the work to the data and then to the interpretation. Is that is that correct? Did I get that correct? Yeah, right. I, I think that's. I kind of want to make a comment of commending you for that um, because I think it's a really important intermediating step in publications between raw data and interpretation, which often gets lost. And I, I, I want to do it myself, so I want to know if there's advice you would have in the struggle of making that kind of transparency of, of middle interpretations uh, available in publications. Yeah, first of all, um, it's of course hard to publish all the data we have on all the intermediate stages, of course I cannot upload uh, thousands of shape files that everyone can trace every step. But um, I have published intermediate steps. Um, they're not all printed in the book. I have, there's a server by my home university where, where I did my PhD in Kiel University. And you can download a lot of, of those data or process data. You have probably you can download the whole profile drawings together with the interpretation of where, are, yeah, where are these different layers are, how are they attributed. 
you have the whole, whole attribute tables are published in the large large tables, and uh, yeah, some shape files printed more or less as, as PDF, a large PDF file that you can trace where the single, single structures are, and you can say, see, okay, which timber features weren't included into into the interpretation. So I, out of the more than nine timber features, I were just able to, um, yeah. I, I, for my, my final analysis, analysis, I about 3,000 for 600 were added to my analysis, but the rest stayed like kind of um, not interpreted. They are still flying around in the street, I guess, and I, <laughs> I'm, I've had the chance to get behind them because they were so scattered and stuff. So, so it's, yeah, it's not that I provided the total data of every single step, of course not, but uh, I. I highlighted every step when I wrote, wrote the text and said, okay, I, I referred always to the chain laboratoire and this uh, linking table and I wrote a text about 40 pages uh, or an introduction of 40 pages into, into the PhD that everyone can, or is able to trace at least the, these, uh, these steps. So, the device, yeah, um, it's, it's a lot of work to do when you publish all those you know, things, of course. So, so, find a strategy maybe to, um, yeah, Little bit, bring it to a simple thing. I, I, I try to do, make it simple that, that everyone can follow up on the things. But yeah, but the general advice it really it's dependent, of course, also on the data and, and what you want to publish. Yeah, of course. Um, Felix, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I liked your use of actor network theory very much, and, uh, but at, at this stage in the uh, process, of um, the archaeological process, the material itself has almost like become subsumed within acts of inscription, uh, representations and um, descriptions and so on, and, and then in uh, another layer of digitalization. Do you, I mean, that's inevitable in a way, but how do you um, cope with that kind of detachment from the material itself? So really all of that remains of the site is the uh, finds and in, in wrapped up in finds bags and labels. But do you um, do you miss the material itself? Um, uh, that, uh, what, what I mean is the actual uh, the stuff that people were digging back then in the 1970s. Do you find um, it's in a sense you're quite detached from that and necessarily so? But does that become a problem or is that an advantage, so to speak? Yeah, I think it's a rather disadvantage because, good. yeah, I, well, no, I have, I, have, I have a distance to that and I could really yeah. deal with it without any former thoughts of how it might have looked like or how it was going on back then because all the people you were engaged back then, uh, they still have those things in mind. And when I talked to, to the excavator who has retired since years, but he, I was able to meet him and uh, he was really convinced about some of his, his work and he, he always still thought that he can, can, can remember almost every day of excavation back then and he excavated right. more than seven years on this uh, single site. So, um, so I talked to him maybe on, on yeah, how uh, some certain kind of timber features and uh, he was convinced that they don't exist but I found them in the documentation and yeah. I talked to the professional drafter and um, the, they were really convinced that they documented everything and they applied the symbology really um, yeah, in, 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 in a perfect manner. But uh, when I digitized this with, with my colleagues um, or with the technicians, uh, we, we stepped up a lot of problems that occurred so that they were not, yeah, they didn't use the same color for the same kind of, of soil layer yeah. stringently through the, the whole uh, excavation process, documentation process. And so there's, this helped me, of course, to uh, have a different view on the thing. But on the other hand, uh, 
sometimes I struggle because I never ever had a feeling, a real feeling of the size. So what you usually have yeah. when you have touched the soil, get a feeling of the size of uh, the wooden features when you can sit in, inside. And yeah, mm -hmm. so the only thing was that I, uh, of the split wood planks from those platforms in the, uh, in the, in the Schleifjord, they some have, have survived and have been uh, on display in the museum. And uh, the first time I stepped up to them, I was really surprised how huge they are. They, when they have the four meter split wood planks, so it's, mm -hmm. When you, yeah, it's, 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 it's massive. So when you have those uh, emerging from those huge bulkheads, and um, when you always have the small two D drawings and then the three D extensions, but it's not, of course, not why not that kind of impressive and uh, yeah. gives you a different feeling of how much effort was put into this, this uh, to set up this whole waterfront within a couple of years. So.